Hi, my name is Melissa Basinger, and I am an Instructional Design Specialist in the Academy for Teaching Excellence at Harper College. Today, we are going to give a lesson a makeover by applying a proven strategy to make that lesson shine. First, we'll start with the lesson before the makeover, and the lesson is on one of my favorite things, chocolate. Here's my lesson. Most chocolate you buy at the store is tempered. To temper it yourself, Heat chocolate to 108 degrees, remove from heat, add seed chocolate, and stir until it reaches 89 degrees. Then use the chocolate for dipping, coating, or making solid candies. Chocolate should be stored at room temperature. Chocolate that is not tempered may melt to the touch at room temperature. Now, while we can definitely see the lesson is about chocolate, it doesn't seem to have a very clear main point. There's also some vocabulary in here that wasn't very well defined. And I think students would generally struggle with, you know, what did Melissa really want to get across to me about chocolate in this lesson? It really suffered from a clear strategy and clear organization. Robert Gagné, educational psychologist, said organization is the hallmark of effective instructional materials. He tells us to have a strategy. And he goes beyond just giving great quotes about it. He developed a tool called Gagné's Nine Events of Instruction. And this is the tool that we will use to make over our chocolate lesson. So I'll go over the nine events of instruction briefly, and then I'll apply it to my chocolate lesson and see if we can't make it shine. So the first of the nine events is to get students' attention. They've got a lot going on before they step into your classroom. So telling a compelling story, asking a probing question, bringing up a current event, uh, these are all ways to get students focused on what you're going to be covering that day. Then explain your objectives for the lesson. Tell students very clearly what you will be covering in the lesson and what's, what they will get out of it and what they will learn by the time they leave. Before you start diving into the content, it's really helpful to get students to recall what they already know about that content. This may be things that you've covered in a previous lesson, even a previous course, but it could also be things in the world around them where if they bring those things to mind, it will help them to make new connections and comparisons with the content. Then it's time to dive in and present your content. Try to do this in a variety of ways if possible. Show images, use text, use your voice, um, use manipulative things, things the students can actually hold on to presented through song or games or group work. Present the content in a variety of ways so that all students have a chance to grapple with the content. And then help the students learn. You can do this by chunking the content into clear segments, providing good examples and good non-examples to help students really understand the concepts to point out common mistakes or pitfalls that students usually encounter as they're learning the material for the first time, or teach them or have them develop maybe mnemonic devices. All of these things will help students learn the content. Make sure students get a chance to practice in a low stakes or non-graded environment. This will help them build their confidence about the material and make sure they can understand where they are having trouble or where they still need work. Give free, frequent feedback to students and have peers give feedback to one another. And give students a chance to demonstrate their new understanding of the content by assessing their performance. At the conclusion of the lesson, help students retain what they've learned. This could be developing a study guide or a job aid or um, a concept map or having students connect with professionals in the field on Twitter or social media or through professional organizations so they can continue to use what they've learned in the lesson. So these are Gagné's nine events and we are going to apply them to my chocolate lesson to see if we can make it shine. So watch the new lesson and see if you can identify the nine events in action. So I'd like to 
ask those of you that are listening if you've ever melted chocolate before for cooking or baking. I'm guessing many of you listening probably have, but I'm guessing a lot fewer of you have tempered chocolate before. So when you are melting chocolate in the kitchen, the vast majority of the time, what you actually want to do is tempering chocolate, is temper the chocolate. So this is my lesson, temper, temper, how to temper chocolate. And I've got three objectives for this lesson. First of all, what is tempered chocolate? What is tempering chocolate? Why would you want to do it in your kitchen? And then how can you do it um, in your own home? So those are my three objectives for the lesson. So first of all, what is tempered chocolate? The vast majority of the chocolate you buy at the store is tempered. So tempered chocolate is the heating and cooling process that gives chocolate the wonderful qualities that we love about it beyond the taste. It makes it very shiny. It has a good snap when you break it. It doesn't melt in your hand. It melts in your mouth. Um, those are the tempering of chocolate is what gives it all those fantastic qualities even beyond the taste. When you melt chocolate using a tempering process, as you can see on the right with the spoon, it retains those qualities. It has a smooth, shiny surface. It sets very quickly, has a good snap, all those things that we want. If you just melt chocolate instead of temper it, you just stick it in the microwave and zap it, it will not retain all of those fantastic qualities as when you, you know, before it was melted down. It will be very dull, it will be gloopy, it will be slow to set, um, and it will melt to the touch. So it will also get kind of um, white flecks on it, kind of a filmy coloring. Um, over time, that's called bloom. That's another thing that can happen without tempering. Uh, so as you know, just one, <laughs> as you can see here, the tempered chocolate on the left versus the non-tempered chocolate on the right, it's just much better for working with in the kitchen. Uh, it will just make all of your confections so much better. So we've covered, you know, the why you would want to temper your chocolate. So now we'll talk about how. Tempering chocolate is actually fairly easy. Uh, all you need is 16 ounces or more of chopped chocolate, a pot and heat proof bowl, candy thermometer, and a rubber spatula. First of all, you'll just want to boil a couple of inches of water on the stove. Then turn off the heat or turn it to very low and set your heat proof bowl over the top and put about two thirds of your chopped chocolate in the bowl, not all of it, just two thirds. Then stir over the simmering water until it is smooth. Now make sure you do not get any water inside the chocolate. Water will mess with the makeup of the chocolate and it will cause it to seize. It will, the chocolate will become both kind of liquidy and chunky. It's not very good. So keep it water free and stir until smooth over that simmering water. Once it's smooth, start checking the temperature and heat it over the simmering water until it reaches 108 degrees Fahrenheit. Once it's reached 108 degrees, pull it off the heat and then immediately stir in that remaining one third of the reserved um, chopped chocolate. So put in the rest of your chocolate and stir and stir and stir. That uh, remaining one third of chocolate called seed chocolate will kind of remind the newly melted chocolate of its chemical makeup. So you'll stir in that uh, one third reserved chocolate. Keep stirring, 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 testing the temperature until it gets back to 89 degrees. Once it's reached 89 degrees, it is perfect for dipping, for working with, and you will have perfectly tempered chocolate for all of your homemade confections. So now that we've gone through the what is tempered chocolate, the why would you want to do it, and the how, we'll just do a quick check for understanding. Here we've got a picture of a chocolate covered strawberry, and you can see a thumbprint on it because it melts very easily to the touch. Is this likely tempered or not tempered? And if you said not tempered, you are correct. Another quick check for understanding. Which of the following is not a step in the tempering process? Heating chocolate to 108 degrees, adding seed chocolate and stir, 
add water to thin as needed, or cool chocolate to 89 degrees. If you said C, you were absolutely correct. We definitely do not want to add water to chocolate, uh, any type of melted chocolate, but during the tempering process, it will just ruin it. Now, if I was delivering this tempering chocolate lesson in class, uh, I would potentially give this type of assessment to the students. I'd have them practice it at home. Once they've gotten the hang of it, once they've gotten the hang of it, take photos of themselves going through the process and post to a class blog. Then have a friend or family member test the end result and include their assessment in their post. So there is my new chocolate lesson uh, with the nine events of instructions uh, applied to it. So did you spot the nine events of instruction? I have another slide here that has some of my notes about where I was trying to use the nine events. So I asked at the beginning, I asked you if you'd ever melted chocolate before, if you'd ever tempered it. I then explained my three objectives. Uh, I got you to think about the chocolate that you'd seen um, in the store. Think about chocolate that you have experience with. I presented the content through pictures, uh, speaking, and text. I helped students learn. I tried to highlight common mistakes. I showed both examples and non-examples of uh, tempered chocolate. And then I took real pictures in my own kitchen to help you imagine what it would be like tempering chocolate in your own kitchen. Um, I gave a couple of check understanding questions to have you practice. I uh, gave you feedback on those, and then I at least explained how I would assess performance and help you retain what you've learned with your blog post. So hopefully you spotted some of those things as the lesson went along. Um, I, I think applying the nine events in instruction really did make over my chocolate lesson. So I'm very thankful to Robert Gagne for his nine events. So I hope you too go forth and use a great strategy in your classroom um, at the Academy for Teaching Excellence at Harper College. Uh, we're always here to help you with strategies and tools to make your lessons shine. So please visit us at harper-academy.net. And thank you very much.